Hi, and welcome to On the Political Page. I'm your host, Rocky Holland. With me today is District 18 for the Connecticut State House of Representatives representative, Jillian Gilchrist. And Jillian has a new book out, uh, Feminist Advocacy, Championing Gender and Social Justice. And this is going to be coming out in uh, early October? Is that in, in mid to late October. Mid to late October, okay. And for lazy people such as myself who don't pick up a book, it's also going to be an audio book? Yes, it is. And is that narrated by you? That is narrated by me. Oh, wow. Okay. And that's, so I guess you would go on like uh, Audible? Yes, uh, you can get it on like Audible. On Audible. Okay. Very cool. So that's exciting. So yes. What, uh, what's, the, what's the book all about then? Great, yes. I guess what prompted you to write a book first? It's, yeah. Uh, Thank you for having me. Oh, um, yeah. A few things. So I think we need um, more pro-choice uh, Democratic women um, in positions of leadership, um, doing advocacy, working on campaigns. Um, I also think the way we teach or don't teach women's history does a disservice. Um, and so this book hopes to fill in some of those blanks. Um, and then um, just 20 years of experience doing advocacy here in the state of Connecticut um, before, you know, I'm elected now, but I've yeah. been doing advocacy, uh, just have some tips and experiences that I'm hoping people can find useful. So in terms of um, women's history, what, what you think that they're failing to teach or any specifics as, as far as that goes? And it's not just women's history. I think we do a disservice in this country. We, we teach history as like moments in time. Uh -huh. And we don't have all the time in the world, right, right. to fill in those blanks. Right. Um, but when we hear about women got the right to vote, Roe v. Wade, you know, passed. And we don't fill in the context of all the advocacy and struggles and backlash uh, that goes with those um, moments. Um, I think we get to a point in time today, like with the Dobbs decision, where it can seem confusing for folks because mm -hmm. they don't they don't have that context. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm hoping to fill in some of those blanks for people. Okay. So we are, uh, when it, I guess when it comes to um, abortion, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's really three takes that you tend to fall into. One is that there should be no abortion allowed. One is we should allow it, but the state should not pay for it. Mm -hmm. And the third would be we should allow it and the state should cover the cost or the, the federal government should also cover the cost. Where would you fall along that spectrum? So an interesting, you know, that, and that's one particular piece of the debate. Mm -hmm, right. um, I'm of the mind that uh, abortion is healthcare. And so in that continuum of reproductive healthcare, the state should cover it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think when we've made these caveats over the years, um, that has uh, continued to push abortion outside the box of healthcare. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm also of the mind, like certainly people have their personal and religious beliefs, mm -hmm. um, and that's fine. No one is telling someone with a personal or religious belief to have an abortion. Um, I'm a opposed very much so to folks' religious and personal beliefs influencing public policy. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I come from when right. talking about abortion. Right. This, is, this would be uh, the people who... Uh... I guess the religious groups that stand out in front of the abortion clinics throwing the, the small Bibles at people, yes. that kind of thing. Uh, I understand that. So um, as I, anything else as, as far as the book goes, uh, gender and social justice, where do we go? Uh, what's, what does that kind of entail? Yeah, uh, so it's really, it, it starts, the book starts by explaining kind of how I came to feminism mm -hmm. um, and highlighting some key historical moments that for me as a child, I didn't even know. Um, you know, I don't know about yourself, but when you're growing up, unless you're having these dialogues with your family, and we weren't talking about women's history in particular, um, I didn't learn about key things like um, the ERA or um, Title IX or uh, Roe v. Wade. Like, again, it heard about them, but didn't know where they fell in the context of my growing up. Um, so I really take the reader kind of a look back in what was going on in my life and now to know the full picture of what the national um, landscape was in terms of women's rights. And then um, lead the reader through kind of my journey to becoming a feminist leader mm -hmm. um, by sharing experiences and advocacy tips and tools in the hopes that it might support or help folks um, who wanna take a similar path. 
So no spoilers then. Are there any particular things that happened to you in your life that you can say kind of led you to to get into this and I guess to eventually write a book? And... Yes. Um, and yeah, not a spoiler at all. Interestingly, and I, I go more into this in the book, but um, always, you know, so I grew up, um, was born in 1982. And so late 80s, early 90s, um, there was a lot of stranger danger um, and was taught at a young age about the concept of sexual violence, but didn't really know what that meant. Mm -hmm. um, but always grew up kind of with this, this fear and why is that a thing? And so interestingly in college, um, found my way to a sexual assault crisis center uh, to be a volunteer. And upon graduating from college, needed a job. My parents were old school. You, you went to work, you weren't going home. Mm -hmm. um, and so got a job at the crisis center as a child advocate. And that job um, immediately realized I'm not cut out for direct service. I'm very appreciative of those who are, um, but it, it motivated me to want to make systems change yeah. um, to pursue policy. And so that's when I started taking some classes at the Yukon School of Social Work for policy, was able to get a job at the legislature. Um, and so that, that was a key pivotal moment of realizing um, that these interests, these passions, these issues that disproportionately impact women, um, I could take a role in trying to change that through policy. Mm -hmm. And you would like to see that taught more in, I guess, uh, high school, middle school, college, all of the above? So, uh, where, where are we lacking the most? Yeah. It, it seems like this, I don't want to say it almost yeah. reads like a textbook, but it could probably use supplement, supplementally in a classroom setting. It could potentially. Based on the way you're describing it. Yes. So where, where are we missing, you think, the most? I think, again, and it's it's not just specific to women's history. I think we do this with a variety of um, groups and, uh, yeah, groups in this country in that, like civil rights, for example, like we teach about the civil rights movement, but don't connect it to um, issues with with racism and his you know systemic systemic racism in our country um, same thing with uh, women's rights and so I don't know it, in an ideal world um, we'd be teaching these things K through 12 I think what tends to happen is there are teachers who do teach more robustly on these subjects it depends on the teacher you get mm -hmm. um, and so um, it's just my hope that this book for anyone who wants to read um, would fill in some of those gaps that you might not learn about. So again, for example, back to, um, you know, I've, I've done quite a bit in anti-sexual violence and um, it was shocking for me to learn that um, sexual assault was legal inside marriage until I was about nine years old. Um, the last state didn't change that law until the late 80s. Well, when we fast forward today and, her, and you know, the Me Too movement happened mm -hmm. and we're having conversations about consent, I think it's helpful for folks to know kind of where the journey has come from. Um, I think because we don't teach those things, it, it's out of context today. And so it's my hope, again, very focused on women's rights issues that I can fill in some of those blanks. Yeah. You know, on this topic, one of the things that struck me that I heard very recently, I don't, I, I have to imagine every state at this point has done away with this or every college, but you've heard stories about girls that were sexually assaulted and because there was alcohol at the event and they go to the center and say, I was sexually assaulted, they say, well, we could report this, but if we do, you're going to get kicked out of school because you were drinking at this event. Is yeah. that still going on anywhere? It still might be on some campuses. It's been campus that by campus, state by state. Blows my mind. Yes. Yeah. And nice. yeah, <laughs> and that again. So good point. So um, during when I was working at the Connecticut Alliance to End Sexual Violence, which was back, I believe it was 2016. That's when students at the University of Connecticut filed. Um, a, a lawsuit, a civil rights lawsuit, um, arguing that their civil rights had been violated by the university. Um, and at that time, um, most campuses in the country maybe were piecemealing together policies, but there was no state policy about what uh, college campuses needed to do to address mm -hmm. sexual violence. Um, and so, you know, when you're raising that point about how shocking 
um, it is that someone could go and report sexual violence and be told, well, actually, now you're in trouble because you were drinking. Right. Um, my hope is that this illustrates, yeah, change takes time. Um, it's, you know, it's step by step and we need more people in this, in this fight, in this journey. And here's some information on like how we've gotten to where we are. Yeah. Uh, when we talk about um, kind of domestic violence, domestic abuse, there's so many tentacles with this because it's not just someone physically harming their spouse. There's the financial abuse mm -hmm. there. It, and, and when it comes to things like that, you know, you see abuse, the abusers are able to continue the abuse if they can convince the abused that there's nothing that you can do. I'm controlling the finances. Uh, if you decide to do something, you're going to be destitute. People hear abuse and they think that it's just the physical violence. There is uh, um, just constantly telling someone, putting them down in front of other people. There's, mm -hmm. there's so many areas of abuse that uh, can cause just as much harm in so many ways that I don't think people are really, as far as on the state level, do you feel like we're doing enough to see to it that someone say who is in a situation where they're being verbally abused or um, undergoing financial abuse, do you think we're doing enough? Because obviously if you come in with a black eye, that's going to be yeah. taken, the way that the system is set up now. But there are still some loopholes where someone can commit abuse and get away with it for a long period of time. And, and do you feel that the state is, is doing enough or is there more that we could do in that regard? And so I, there's certainly more we could be doing. Um, we've been making incremental changes um, and have added to the definition of domestic vi uh, violence, financial abuse. Um, we've also talked about coercive control. Um, but an, another thing I, I touch on in the book is this idea that you can pass public policy, but you also need to be working on culture change. And so it's very much that, like we can, we can pass a law, but until we really also implement the law, the practices go into place and we really try and change a culture yeah. where certain things are accepted. Mm -hmm. The other piece, you know, as you're talking about all the different tentacles of domestic violence, um, speak to the importance of um, listening to people's experiences mm -hmm. because, you know, for, for many people, they hear about I'll just, like a woman being beaten by her husband. Well, of course she would leave. Mm -hmm. They don't, you know, it's, we need to listen to the stories to understand what are the barriers mm -hmm. um, and how long it's been going on and how systematic. And so it really is another thing I, you know, uh, harp on in the book is the importance of listening to experiences to better inform how we make policy change. Yeah, it's, uh... I think the most common reason that you hear is I want to stay together for the kids, for the sake of the kids. And uh, I, I don't really want to insert my opinion on that because there can be a lot of people can be very opinionated on what's the better choice. But uh, when it comes to abuse, I, 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 I will insert my opinion. Yeah. I think it, I, I think it's I think it's kind of tough to uh, always feel like staying with the kids if it's if the abuse is really, really bad. But, um, yeah, so that's. Uh, We'll, we'll skip away from this for a moment. Um, we've covered enough of that. Uh, something that um, I, I noticed that you were into, this is interesting, uh, endometriosis law. Yes. There is a uh, law 6672 establishing endo-rise. Uh, it's requiring school nurses to establish endometriosis data and biorepository program in layman's terms. Can you tell yes. us kind of what that means? And I'm going to keep, so tie into the book, this is another reason I think it's so important for women um, to serve in office and be involved in advocacy because endometriosis is a disease that impacts one in 10 individuals with a uterus, disproportionately women. And um, unfortunately, it takes on average 10 years to diagnose. Um, and so for, there's also um, different uh, levels. So some people have, you know, have type four um, endometriosis. Um, and so it can connect um, its tissue, uh, similar tissue found in the uterus that, uh, that sh would shed each month that connects itself to different parts of the body. Mm -hmm. And so um, women are in a great deal of pain. Um, it causes 50% of infertility in the country. 
Um, and the most mind-blowing thing I learned when I first learned about this is how little is known. Um, so healthcare providers are not taught about this. So you have all of these women sharing these stories of from an early age being in so much pain every time they get their period and just being told that's normal, it's in your head, stop being so dramatic. Um, and that can really take a toll on people. And then they tell me years later, they finally get a diagnosis and then to be told, oh, now you can't have kids. Like, oh, you did have something wrong wow. and you can't have kids. So decided to form um, an endometriosis working group at the legislature and bring together um, different professionals, different state agencies, healthcare providers, advocates, those living with the disease. Uh, we have national folks who participate just to really learn what's going on, what is it, and what could we potentially do in the state. And one of the big pieces is that there's still not a diagnostic tool or a cure or treatment. I, <laughs> as I was reading through it, I was like, this sounds familiar. Now, I, full HIPAA, my wife gave me permission okay. to say, <laughs> she was diagnosed with endometriosis when she was younger. And then later in life, they said she does not have it. And then after having kids, they said, oh, okay, we have something called microscopic endometriosis. Hmm. And so misdiagnosis. Yes. And misdiagnosis. now you've explained to us why, because we're not, we're not teaching it enough. Yes. I guess at the, at, at the nurse level? At the all levels. At all levels. So OBGYNs, mm -hmm. nurses, um, primary care, yeah. pediatricians. Mm -hmm fertility specialists. So you have women going for multiple treatments for fertility and then being told, oh, you have endometriosis. Like this was never working. And actually it's flaring it up. Like right. it's worse for you. Yeah. Um, and so the EndoRise is a, a, the first of its kind in the country, um, mm -hmm. a biorepository. It's collecting samples with the goal being that researchers at Jackson Laboratory in partnership with Yukon Health and then they're actually gonna branch out to all the hospitals in the state to get the samples, will be able to do research to try and get a diagnostic because the only way you can get official diagnosis currently is invasive surgery. And by diagnosing it and taking care of it uh, in kind of the nascent stages, this uh, might allow someone who otherwise wouldn't be able to have kids if it was left alone to have kids. Is that yes, now there's still unfortunately many barriers um, at the federal level, uh, the insurance coding is not uh, accurate. And so insurance doesn't on a whole cover um, the surgery that would be needed to remove it. And so we're working on that because currently it's quite expensive um, to get the surgery folks need. Um, but it's kind of like once the tentacles again, um, once we started working on this issue, it was like, we need to educate people, right? We need to change the insurance codes. We need to educate uh, the doctors. And yeah. so we're trying, you know, we're taking bits at a time um, and raising awareness. I've been speaking with other states who might uh, model what we've done here and create their own working groups. We met with um, every member of the federal delegation this summer to push for more research dollars. Uh, so we're trying our best to really elevate this issue. And, and I'm trying to understand, it wouldn't be covered because would this be considered a voluntary surgery? So there's two types of um, procedures currently. There's ablation, which is is a burning off of yep. the tissue. That's, and then there's excision. We have some experience okay. with that. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And then the yeah. excision is has been described to me like, um, like a cancer surgery. It's very yeah. um, intricate and yeah. it takes experts. And so that can be like five to eight hours, okay. whereas ablation is about an hour. Mm -hmm. Well, the insurance is paying the same uh, reimbursement. Oh, okay. And if someone says, someone tries to go see an excision surgeon, the insurance out of state, the uh, insurance says, no, you, you have someone who can cover that. Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, that's ablation, but yep. it's the same code. So we're... Ah. <laughs> Yeah. I could probably do a three-hour show on insurance alone. <laughs> I, there, there, yes. there, our, our theme today, by the way, is tentacles, apparently. But, uh, there are a lot of tentacles with yeah. insurance, with the education of insurance, with how insurance is impacting uh, the, the bottom, the amount of money that people are, are able to make. Yep. And then you've got um, 
the prescription drug end of it, what's covered under insurance. And you're actually seeing situations where the insurance companies are dictating health care yes. for people. Yes. And I, I, I work in pharmacy and what I see happen is the insurance companies say, we're not going to pay for this medicine. Um, so go back to the doctor and tell them to prescribe something else. And so they, they find that, and it might happen two or three times before they can finally land on something where the insurance company is going, okay, this is what your care is going to accept. Yeah. Yeah. That is, that when is, we uh, should be listening to what the doctor has to say for their patients. You, uh, I, I noticed that you're big on Medicaid. Mm -hmm. um, so there is, uh, there, there was something that was proposed by the governor, fee for service, uh, versus managed care. So, yes. so we had, from what I was able to gather, we had managed care up until 2010, and then we switch to fee for service. Yes. Okay, and that's what we have now. And you feel Correct. that the fee for service is better than managed care when it comes to Medicaid? Yes. And what, what would be the reasons for that? So managed care in the most basic terms is giving a big chunk of money to a company, like an insurance company, and that's who would bid for it, mm -hmm. to manage the entire Medicaid program. Um, I've been told that when we did that in the past, all that data, all that information on who's being served, if how long they're waiting to see a provider is hard to come by mm. because now that's that's theirs. owned by the insurance um okay currently in the state we have a problem with we have not increased the reimbursement rate so um an example a dental cleaning costs 150 dollars. we reimburse at 20. Mm -hmm. um a knee replacement we don't, Medicaid currently doesn't cover the cost of the knee replacement part. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've been told by those doctors that they do one Medicaid patient a year and it's kind of like they're donating it mm -hmm. because it financially doesn't make sense. So what we really need to be doing is figuring out how we can in increase those fees, how we can reimburse what the care actually costs. Mm -hmm. My fear is that this is a strategy to go to managed care because that company then gets to decide what those reimbursement mm -hmm. rates are. And since the bottom line would be driving it, I, I, would, I would assume that would stay very low. And so I think over time, we're just going to see the Medicaid program fall apart and people have less access to care than they currently do or need to have. Uh, I work in an end of pharmacy that deals with, with independent pharmacies, and the number one reason that I've been told every time one shuts down, it's because the reimbursements for the drugs are oftentimes less than what they're paying for it. Mm. And, and it's gotten out of control to the point to where um, the, the management companies that are kind of setting and dictating where the, um, uh, the pharmacy benefit managers are dictating what's being paid for the drugs has gotten to the point that they can't make a profit and they have to actually send a patient up the road because they say we can't we're not going to buy this drug because we're not going to be reimbursed for it enough to even pay for it which is why which is insane yeah right? it's insane but, but the the what the intermingling between healthcare and insurance you got to say there's there's got to be more that we could do yeah but again tentacles yeah there's th yes. it's there's there's so many things that uh, that are just intertwined with each other and and good people with good with mm -hmm. jobs that would be lost if we were to just throw a bomb on it at the same time. And so I, I don't really know what the answer is, but it almost seems like there is something that we could do. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, one thing that I saw that you were um, advocating for, credit rating and medical debt. Mm -hmm. right? So what this, this would have to do with if you um, have medical debt, it cannot be a knock against your credit rating. Correct. How, how does that work? I, that's exactly it. So we passed a, a bill that now is a law mm -hmm. that if you have if you have medical debt, it doesn't count against your credit rating. Um, and that also goes for um, if you have a specific medical credit card. There are now specific medical credit cards only used okay. um, in medical settings. And the the research illustrated that folks who have medical debt they don't have other debt. Um, you know, a medical debt, unfortunately, for many is like a one time mm -hmm. horrible thing that happened that they weren't unexpected event. Yeah. And now they have that debt. And so why should that negatively impact you? Because it isn't giving an accurate picture um, of your credit. 
And so we were able to pass that. That's um, great. Yeah. Um, uh, what What are your thoughts? This is completely, my, my <laughs> mind started going in 20 directions with this, but it seems to me like there could be, for someone who's had their identity stolen, and that goes against their credit rating mm. for, uh, we had this happen with my wife, but for a couple of years, um, your credit rating gets a hit against it. I really wish that they could create a law that says if your identity is stolen and you're fighting it and there's a whole process that you have to go through, that there was somehow that you could set something in place so that your credit rating would not go down while you're fighting it. Yep. But as it stands now, your credit rating takes a pretty good hit if, if someone steals your identity and say opens up a credit card or buys something in your, in your name and, yep. it, and, it, and it defaults to, to the creditors. Well, I'm going to tie it back to the book because <laughs> um, this is exactly how I do advocacy and policy making. So I will follow up with you because there <laughs> should be a law. Like oh, okay. it, it truly comes from listening to people's experiences because that is absurd. And, you know, what I'd need to do is figure out, OK, has this, you know, been done in other states? Could we do it? How can we do it? But that is ridiculous yeah. um, and is something we could potentially change. Yeah. So uh, you you were big on gun control there for a while. You want to you want to skip this topic or no, that's fine. I remember a few years back because I I, lo I run it this called on the political page. I run a local political page, and there were some the the two A crowd really got upset when you wanted to tax bullets. Yes, and I, I'm please don't get upset when no. I say that. I thought it was hysterical uh, how upset they got because I was like, okay, you're, so you wanted to tax bullets, but yeah. um, people got really mad. Yes, they that did. <laughs> They got madder at that than if you like wanted to take away their AR forty seven. Yeah. Like I'm. I'm. So what? What was? How did that I think go? It again, did it again? So address this in the book. Um, I think because it hit two pieces. I think it was it tax uh -huh. and um, guns. Um, but I stand by that proposal. Right. It has shifted over the years, and actually, as of last year, we wouldn't be the first state anymore. California has done it, mm -hmm. um, and so. The point is to create a sustainable funding stream for gun violence prevention programs. Mm -hmm. And so it would be a tax on ammunition. Mm -hmm. um, California has actually taken it a step further and they've done ammunition and guns. Um, policy, again, change takes time. Mm -hmm. So um, introduced the bill the year before the pandemic, the pandemic year, obviously that killed it. Um, pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> so I, we introduced it again last year, had some more conversations. This one's definitely a policy that needs, you know, time to, to breathe. Yeah, okay. I, I think it was Chris Rock that put it best when he said, make the bullets cost $5,000 because if a bullet costs $5,000, there will be no more innocent bystanders. Hmm. So that's, hmm. that's exactly, I think that was bring the pain. Yeah. <laughs> so, somewhere in the early 90s, I just aged myself there. We've got very little time left, but uh, I want to say thanks for coming on the show. Uh, the new book that's coming out, Feminist Advocacy, Championing Gender and Social Justice, out in early October, and audiobook as well. Yep. That you've spent a lot of time on, I'm sure. That's uh, <laughs> that, For your next book, if you need, I mean, my, you hear my voice here, it's not if you need somebody to narrate that one. Awesome. Go Wonderful. ahead and offer my services up for that. But uh, anyway, so that's great. Thank Good you so much for having out, me. And uh, that'll be uh, uh, early to mid-October and... We'll be doing book signings and yep. I guess we'll yes. see Yes, book launch is the 22nd. All right. Well, this has been the latest episode of On the Political Page. I'm your host, Rocky Holland. With me today, District 18th, running for re-election, yes. unopposed. But uh, so we won't, we won't cover that. But thank you, Jillian, for coming on today. Thank you for having okay. me. Sure.